Welcome back runners. Heart rate. It's been around for decades and still coaches and athletes alike are confused on the science of heart rate. Using my expertise as a sports scientist and my experience as a runner, I want to give you some science-backed explanations using my own training data to show you where heart rate just doesn't make any sense. If you've watched me for a while, you know I love zone 2 training. It's the bread and butter of my programs, whether I'm training for a 1500 meter track race or a half day ultra marathon. However, sometimes I'll notice that I'm out for an hour or so and my heart rate will start to drift into zone 3. Now I haven't sped up, I haven't put in any more effort, but my heart rate's trending up. The same thing can happen if I'm out for a few hours on the trails for an ultra marathon training block. I have to start walking some of the uphills I'd normally easily jog up just to keep my heart rate low. So what's happening? What's happening is something termed cardiac drift. Now this is a different phenomenon than when you experience a massive heart rate increase say over the back end of the marathon and you're wondering how can I run above threshold heart rate in a marathon when I'm well below my threshold in pace. That I'll explain after cardiac drift. For now I'll just focus on cardiac drift to help explain why your heart rate starts trending upwards on a relatively easy run without an increase in effort or you feeling tired at all, I need to introduce the cardiac output equation. Please don't click off, it's a pretty simple equation. I'll break it down for you now. Cardiac output, CO, is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Heart rate, you know and love. Stroke volume is simply the volume of blood your heart pumps per beat. When we combine those together, we get cardiac output in liters per minute, the amount of blood pumped per minute by your heart. So unless it's completely freezing, when I head out on my general zone two run, I get warmer. When I get warmer, two important physiological events occur. I redistribute blood flow to cool myself down and I sweat. These two physiological factors influence my cardiac output and require me to increase my heart rate. See, in order to cool myself down, I'll start pumping blood along the skin of my extremities, that's your arms and legs, so that you can get rid of the heat, assuming the environment is at a lower temperature than your core temperature, around 37 and a half degrees Celsius. The other thing we can do is sweat. So when the sweat hits your skin, it can evaporate. And this evaporation is an endothermic reaction, which withdraws some of the energy from your skin, helping cool you down. These two simple physiological events mean that my heart rate has to increase to maintain my cardiac output. A great example of this is when I did a 24 hour track event as a team. So every four hours or so we ran for an hour and then we passed on to the next person. Being around an athletics track, it creates a pretty standardized environment for comparing my hour efforts. In the hottest part of the day, the early afternoon, I think it was my second block, I ran just over four minute Ks, 4.02. So around the 6.30 mile on average, average heart rate was 166 BPM for the 173 or so max heart rate. The next morning after I'd already done four blocks is around 5 a.m. So I've run about 60 Ks already, around 40 miles I guess. I was able to run just under four minute Ks, so around a 6.20 mile for an average heart rate of 157 and then a max heart rate of 166. So my max heart rate on the cooler conditions under a bit of fatigue was the same as my average heart rate in the hottest conditions. Now if we'd done a lactate test or a VO2 test, I'd imagine that I was working at relatively the same percentage of my threshold or VO2 max, yet I was working at a heart rate around eight beats higher on average in the hottest part of the day with it trending up. So I mean, what does that mean knowing that it was a cardiac drift causing an increase in heart rate? For me personally, as someone who is severely affected by the heat, I need to be really conscious of why my heart rate is increasing and how I'm feeling. Because with my background with heat illness, I need to understand that I'm probably trending on an upward trajectory for a heat stroke or heat related issue later down in the race or training session that I'm completing. So my default is to just slow down and try and get myself back into a zone two, despite knowing that metabolically I'm absolutely fine. Overall, holistically, I'm probably trending towards being too hot. So while cardiac drift can explain how our heart rate can continue to increase across a general zone 2 run where we're not putting in any more effort and we otherwise feel great, what explains 
why I can run the last 30 minutes of my marathon at 180 beats a minute when my threshold is 180 beats a minute. That would be the O2 slow component, which is a complex interplay of different functions that occur during a prolonged steady state run that cause an increase in VO2, so your oxygen utilization, without an increase in speed. Factors such as mitochondrial efficiency, metabolic rate, and muscle fiber type recruitment. Right now I'll explain the O2 slow component and its impacts on your training, and then I'll get into why I never use heart rate for short duration interval prescription. So while cardiac drift can kind of be ignored in hot conditions, assuming you have the capacity to cool yourself down, O2 slow component can definitely not be ignored because it's gonna give you an insight into your true fitness. So why can I average 180 beats, my threshold heart rate for the last 30 minutes of a marathon? I mean, in theory, I should be able to run below my threshold at a metabolic steady state forever. As long as I keep drinking water to offset the loss of fluid from my sweat and I consume carbohydrates to maintain my blood sugar, I mean, I should be good, right? In theory, yes. But if you've been at the back end of a marathon or even an ultra marathon, you'll know it is anything but steady state. Put simply, the O2 slow component gives us a window of insight into how much we're fatiguing across any given steady state effort. So when we initially start off on a zone two run and marathon pace effort, we're gonna predominantly recruit our tight one, slow twitch, super efficient muscle fibers. These things are packed full of mitochondria. They're always recruited first, so they're the ones that get the most training stimulus and they're the most efficient. But after a certain amount of time, those fibers start to break down, so we need to recruit more fibers. These fibers have had less training time and are kind of less efficient so they require more oxygen to do the same amount of mechanical work. So that's running at your given pace. So now we have to increase our heart rate to supply more oxygen, remove some of the byproducts, and our heart rate is showing that we're fatiguing. Then the mitochondria itself starts to break down, and so then we start to need more oxygen, and we're starting to lose some of this energy in different forms and functions, which is released as heat. So it's like at the start of the marathon, we're heating a tiny house with double glazing. Doesn't require much energy to get the job done. But then if we remove the double glazing, open the windows and put that tiny house in the Antarctic, it starts to require a lot of energy to do the same job. That's what's happening in a marathon. It's the same job, start and end, assuming we're maintaining the same pace, and the energy requirement starts to go through the roof as we fatigue. So then how can the O2 slow component give us an indication of our overall fitness? Well, if we think about a marathon, if you wanna run in three hours or four hours or even two and a half hours, I want you to be able to do half that duration without your heart rate going into zone four or trending towards your threshold. If your heart rate hits your threshold or just below your threshold after half the duration of your goal time, that shows me that you are fatiguing at too great a rate and doing twice that duration is just not gonna be possible without blowing up. The same can be said for a half marathon. If you're looking for a one and a half hour or a two hour, I want you to be able to do half that duration without your heart rate going above your threshold because that first half should be a sustainable steady state both cardiovascularly biomechanically and metabolically now i know you're probably thinking well how can i tell if it's cardiac drift or if it's the o2 slow component that my heart rate's increasing and to some extent it doesn't really matter when we're thinking about these event specific workouts or the event itself because if your heart rate is trending up over the first half purely because of the heat well that's showing me that you're accumulating a lot of heat and you're probably going to cook yourself before the end then if it's the o2 slow component i've already explained that 
Then when you couple them together, they make it a unique scenario where you have the heat induced cardiac drift and then the fatigue induced O2 slow component. But they're at such a level that you get a special mix that still ends up being sustainable for the entire marathon and you end up with an outrageously high average heart rate. But typically what will happen is that unique mix won't be sustainable and you end up falling off the back end of the marathon but still maintaining a really high heart rate due to the high load of fatigue and heat induced cardiac drift. Now I'll explain why I don't use heart rate when prescribing short duration intervals. So if we think about some 1k intervals, VO2 max intervals that are going to take a lot of you three to five minutes, it takes a while for heart rate to catch up to the energetic or mechanical work required within the muscle. We have around 30 seconds of oxygen stored within myoglobin within the muscle before blood flow and oxygen extraction needs to catch up. So then if I am saying go to 105% of your threshold heart rate during some of these 1k intervals, what often happens is a runner will absolutely sprint out of the blocks over the first one or two intervals to try and get their heart rate up to you know 185 or 105 percent whatever their threshold is and this is typically well above the target intensity of these specific intervals that i'm trying to achieve and then by the end of the interval they're well below the target intensity so by using pace or power we can easily target the exact physiological stimulus that we're trying to achieve without needing to worry about heart rate. If you're confused about where and how you should be using your heart rate, pace and running power within your training and racing pacing strategies, you should check out this video where I explain how each is implemented. All right, I'll see you on the next one.